device. When the phonograph was first demonstrated in the late 19th century, the public saw it as a miracle of science. For many, it must have seemed like magic. Its creator, Thomas Alva Edison, was certainly regarded by his fellow Americans as something of a magician. The phonograph made him a legend in his own lifetime. More than anyone else, Edison was the technological brain behind America's transformation from an agrarian to an industrial economy. His eventful life story was well known to his contemporaries. At the age of 15, he'd worked on the railways as a newsboy. In his spare time, he performed chemical experiments in the baggage car. Science had always fascinated him. day job was editing, printing and publishing the Weekly Herald, a railway news sheet. Spelling was never his strong point. He'd had virtually no formal education. The young Edison didn't remain a travelling newspaper man for long. He wanted to be a telegrapher, but it was a few years before this dream was realised. In his new job, Edison spent his nights trying to find ways of improving telegraphy. Eventually, he set up in business on his own. This was in 1869, when he was just 22. Specialising in research and development, the firm made good money when he succeeded in selling a stock exchange telegraph to the powerful Western Union Telegraph Company. Seven years later came the next big step. In Menlo Park, near New York City, he started a think tank, the like of which had never been seen before. Here, he employed a few dozen assistants on applied industrial research projects. It was in Menlo Park, too, that Edison invented the phonograph. He'd long been fascinated by the mysteries of sound and speech, perhaps because he'd been hard of hearing since childhood. For his speech experiments, he used diaphragms like those used in the earliest telephones. He came upon the principle of sound recording by sheer chance. Feeling the vibration of the diaphragm, he noticed that the same sound always produced the same movement. Edison realised he could record sounds by somehow concentrating these vibrations and registering them on some sort of carrier, for example, a rotating drum. He always managed very quickly to find practical uses for his brilliant ideas. He had a good eye for the products his inventions would lead to. To the vibrating diaphragm, he attached a metal needle. His first chosen medium for the recording was soft paraffin wax paper. Mary had a little lamb, its fleece was white as snow, and everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. Mary had a little lamb, its fleece was white as snow, Edison soon ascertained that the vibrations did indeed leave a good mark. In his notebook, he later wrote, There's no doubt that I can store the human voice and reproduce it at any time. It didn't take long before he was proved right. In December 1877, he applied for a patent for his phonograph, the first machine for recording and reproducing sound. The robber baron of Menlo Park, as he called himself, together with his loyal and devoted team, had perfected his masterpiece. The first phonograph, and Edison himself speaking. Mary had a little lamb, its feet was white as snow, and everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. Edison advertised his invention as the shorthand typist's friend. 
He saw the phonograph above all as a dictaphone for the modern office. The general public didn't take much notice of it at first. The great sales breakthrough came quite a few years later, but not in the way Edison had imagined. The phonograph suddenly caught on as an entertainment device. Edison's phonographs went into large-scale production just before the turn of the century. They cost up to $35, a lot of money at the time. Listeners were enthralled. There can't have been too many who seriously wondered how it worked. The principle of Edison's original model was extremely simple. A trumpet concentrated the incoming sound waves sufficiently to make the diaphragm at the end vibrate. Mary had a little lamb, its fleece was white as snow, and everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. A needle, also known as a stylus, carved a groove shaped by these vibrations in a sheet of soft tin foil. The needle moved only up and down, producing a so-called Hill and Dale recording. The foil was wrapped on a rotating drum, which also moved sideways, resulting in a helix-shaped groove. Reproducing the sound simply meant reversing the procedure. The stylus was now moved up and down by the contour of the groove, and this made the diaphragm vibrate again. Mary had a little lamb, it shrieked with white as snow, and everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. The trumpet now functioned as a kind of loudspeaker. Edison wouldn't have been true to himself if he hadn't worked to improve his invention. In about 1890, he started using prepared wax for the cylinder surface, replacing this in turn by shellac. As a result, the recording was far more durable. This increased durability opened up whole new markets. The sale of pre-recorded cylinders ushered in the age of home entertainment. The time around the turn of the century was the heyday of the phonograph, but a rival was already waiting in the wings, the gramophone with its rotating flat disc or record. The idea for this came from Emil Berliner, an inventor from Hanover in Germany who'd emigrated to America as a young man. Berliner's flat discs were made of the same materials as Edison's cylinders, but they were easier to mass produce. One master disc could be used to cut thousands of copies. In this system, the stylus moved from side to side. Compared with Edison's Hill and Dale process, it meant less wear and tear and better sound quality. The only person who didn't want to know about these advantages was Edison. He clung onto his phonograph for years, until, in 1912, he had to cease production for lack of demand. However, households were soon listening to discs from Edison's studio, played, of course, on Edison's gramophones. He, too, had seen that the gramophone had won the battle. Its music was livening up living rooms and dance halls all around the world. Improvements weren't slow in coming. The first was the double-sided record. Then, finer grooves and slower playing speeds made the long playing record possible. The advent of the gramophone turned sound recording and record production into expensive and elaborate industrial processes, viable only through mass production. In the early days, the record market was dominated by just a few companies. Affordable records turned singers like Caruso into world stars. 
Later, radio played its part in boosting the record business still further. Airwaves brought popular numbers to every corner of the globe. Having heard the songs on the wireless, record enthusiasts bought them for their collections. Gradually, the record business grew to become a major world industry. There was music in the air, enthralling millions in every walk of life. In the 1950s, rock and roll ushered in a youth culture the like of which had never been seen before. It could never have happened without the thin black disc. Nineteen sixties pop groups like the Beatles also owed a debt of gratitude to Edison and Berlin. Even then, they could hardly count their gold discs awarded for sales in the millions. Today's gramophones share the basic principles with their ancestors, but not much else. Thomas Alva Edison had always dreamt of this perfection, in spite of his own deafness. His greatest wish was to reproduce Beethoven's ninth with perfect fidelity. It was one of the few goals the great inventor didn't reach. Instead, he came up with hundreds of other successful technical innovations, not the least of which was the incandescent electric lamp, the light bulb. Thank you.